magnets can attract iron and other ferromagnetic materials to it over a distance. Electrostatic forces also affect this ball, even though it isn't touching any charged object, and objects will fall to the ground because of the Earth's gravitational field. As a matter of fact, gravitational force attracts every material particle in the universe. Hello, and welcome to the seventh lesson on investigating forces. Today we focus on forces that act through a distance. We will specifically look at gravitational force as an example of a non-contact force. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to define gravitational field strength and state Newton's law of universal gravitation, calculate gravitational force, discuss the control of rockets in space, and discuss the pros and cons of space exploration. Legend has it that Sir Isaac Newton sat under an apple tree and asked himself the question, why does an apple fall down and not up? To answer this question, he came up with the concept of a gravitational field. Basically, the idea is that an invisible force field surrounds all material objects. In other words, that a force field surrounds everything that has mass and that this force field attracts other objects. We call the region around an object in which a particle or other object experiences an attractive force towards it due to its mass, the object's gravitational field. The gravitational field of an object pulls other particles or objects towards its center of mass. So the gravitational field of the Earth pulls things down towards the center of the Earth. On the Earth's surface, the gravitational field strength, G, is 9,81 newtons per kilogram. So what does this mean for us? Well, it means that we can calculate the force of the Earth on a one kilogram packet of apples by taking its mass, one kilogram, and multiplying it by the Earth's gravitational field strength, g. So an object, such as a one kilogram packet of apples, will be pulled towards the Earth with a force of 9,81 newtons. To simplify these types of calculations, scientists decided to approximate the gravitational field strength of the Earth as 10 newtons per kilogram. The concept of an invisible force field, like a gravitational field, is visually represented by lines of force which show the direction in which the force would act on a particle placed at any point in the field. So, gravitational field lines always point towards the center of mass of the object. The work which Sir Isaac Newton did on gravitational force has helped astronomers predict and explain the motion of planets in our solar system and in the wider universe too. His law of universal gravitation gives us a way of calculating the force of attraction acting on any two objects in the universe. Let's see what the law says. Every two particles in the universe attract each other with a gravitational force that is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of their distance apart. This is quite a long statement and it contains some very powerful ideas. Let's unpack what it means. Firstly, it states that every two particles in the universe attract each other. The word particles here refer to even the smallest speck of matter which have mass. But of course, the law applies to all matter. Larger objects are just made up of millions and millions and millions of mass particles packed together. Let's continue to unpack Newton's law of universal gravitation. It further says that the force of attraction between particles or objects is directly proportional to the product of the masses of the particles or objects. This means that the greater the mass of an object is, the greater its force of gravity will be. So, if you double the mass of one object, you double the gravitational force exerted on these two particles. And if both of their masses are doubled, the gravitational force increases fourfold. Practically, we can illustrate this by looking at a simple example. A ball is attracted by the Earth's gravitational field. Because it has so much less mass than the Earth, it will fall down towards the Earth if you let it go. Our Moon is also affected by the Earth's gravitational field. Because of the gravitational force between the Earth and the Moon, the Moon stays in orbit around the Earth. But because the Moon is itself also quite a massive object, its gravitational force prevents it from simply crashing into the Earth's surface. 
Next, let's find out what Newton's law of universal gravitation says about the way that the distance between two particles or objects affects the gravitational force. The law states that the gravitational force of attraction is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the particles. So basically, as the distance between the particles increases, the force of gravity decreases. This decrease depends on the square of their distance apart. If the distance is doubled, the force decreases to one quarter of its original magnitude. This is an inverse square relationship. It may be helpful to plot a graph of force as distances increase to understand this more clearly. Do you see how the force drops off very quickly as the distance is increased? Can you think of examples where this knowledge could be useful? Think about air and space travel. This information means that although it takes quite an effort initially to escape the force of the Earth's gravitational field, the size of this force rapidly reduces and a rocket or airplane will require much less power to stay up in the air as it moves further and further away from the Earth. Now, Newton's law of universal gravitation can also be written as an equation. F is equal to the constant g times the product of the masses of the two objects and divided by the square of their distance of separation. The constant g is called the universal gravitational constant. It applies to all masses anywhere within our universe, hence the title, the universal gravitational constant. Its magnitude is 6,7 times 10 to the power of negative 11 newton meters squared per kilogram squared. We can use this formula to calculate the force of attraction between the Earth and, say, an elephant. The Earth has a mass of 6 times 10 to the power of 24 kilograms. The elephant has a mass of 1,000 kilograms. Their centers of mass are separated by one Earth's radius, which is 6,4 times 10 to the power of 6 meters. The force of the Earth on the elephant is given by 6,7 times 10 to the power of negative 11 times the mass of the Earth and times the mass of the elephant, all over the radius of the Earth, all squared. When we work this out, we find that the Earth attracts the elephant with a force of about 10,000 newtons. Does this seem familiar to you? What do you think an elephant weighs? Yes, it weighs about 10,000 newtons, which is also the magnitude of the force of the Earth on the elephant. When we calculate the force of the Earth on an object on Earth, we are actually finding its weight. When we talk about the gravitational field strength of the Earth, we are actually talking about its acceleration due to gravity. These values and their names are interchangeable. Newton's law of universal gravitation applies to all objects in the universe. Gravitational fields are associated with all objects with mass. Therefore, the stars and moons and planets also all have gravitational fields. We know that our moon's gravitational field is about one-sixth as strong as that on Earth. That is why astronauts feel lighter on the moon, using the same amount of energy they can jump higher on the moon than they can on Earth, and they fall back to the moon at a slower rate than they do on Earth. Questions like, what is out there amongst the stars? Where is the edge of the universe and how can we get there? Have fascinated people from the earliest times. Over the last century, humankind has begun to explore space and to find partial answers. We were fortunate enough to have the opportunity to film some experts. A team from the NASA Astronaut Training Base in Kansas talk about some of the science involved in their work. Um, eight kilometers a second. Going right across there. So it, it is moving pretty fast. And, and when it's up there, you can see it in the night sky. It looks like a pretty bright star that's just flying across the sky. So we're moving at eight kilometers a second. And at that speed, we just equal out the pull of gravity. So we don't fall. We don't take off and go to the moon. We just keep going in a big circle. And that's why it's called the orbiter. It stays up in orbit. All right, our solid rocket boosters. The solid fuel that we fill the outside with here, or fill the outside, fill the rockets that are on the outside, we fill the inside of the rocket. That makes sense, right? Um, the difference between solid and liquid fuel is that we can't really control solid fuel. Once you light it, it's going. If any of you like lit a firecracker or launched a rocket or seen that, once you light that fuse, it's going to go. Once the fuel starts burning, it's going to go. It's going to do what it needs to do. Well, that's one of the problems with our solid fuel, but the benefit of it is it gives us an enormous boost off of the ground, hence the solid rocket boosters. 
our main engines are just not strong enough to get us off the ground. So we've got to get that solid rocket boost. Now to burn something, you need three things. And all of you probably know this. You need oxygen. oxygen. I didn't really ask you, but I thought the would lead you to answer. But, okay. So you need oxygen. Fire. Well, you say fire good too. Fire, water. Okay. Fire. And fuel. Right. You need something to burn. So you gotta have fuel, you gotta have oxygen, you have to have a heat source of some of some kind. There's oxygen in this room, right? Absolutely. If there's not, we're all in big trouble. Um, there is fuel in this room. I've got some cotton right here. Cotton is a solid fuel, right? It's in the gas, it's in the liquid. And I can create fire with a Bunsen burner. I was going to create it out of midair, but I, I can't do that. Duncan went fast enough for me. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take the oxygen or the uh, cotton. I'm going to put 100% oxygen. I'm going to crank up the oxygen concentration within that. And then we're going to add our heat element. And we're going to show you the, the power of, of solid fuel, but also one of the downsides of it. So I'm going to put the mic down so I can concentrate on getting some, some cryogenic fuel together with some all kinds of stuff. We're going to have a little explosion, very little. So those of you in front row, if you need to cover your ears, you can't. Not right now. It'll be just a second. So hold on, and I'll get all dressed up. As we find out more about space and the planets of our solar system, we look for more planets to explore. We want to find out about extraterrestrial life as well as how the universe began, but it will be many years before we have developed the technology to take human exploration across the vast distances required for us to answer all of these questions. There are also many conflicting arguments about space exploration. Is it worth the effort and the expense? Has humankind benefited from space exploration? Should we not spend the money on housing, food, medical care and education here on Earth before we tackle the depths of the universe? Your task today is to discuss aspects of space exploration. Write at least one A4 page on the topic, Is Space Exploration Worth It? This task will require some research on your part. To help you structure your report, you could make a list of the benefits of space exploration for the person on the street. You could also try to answer the following questions. Could we have spent this money better on social upliftment programs here on Earth? What if the space exploration program had never begun? Would we know as much about the beginnings of the universe without physically exploring its vastness? Would our communication systems be as well developed? The universe is made up of many galaxies and solar systems within these galaxies. As huge planets trace their path through the universe, they are pulled into their suns by enormous forces of attraction. It's no wonder that we place such an importance on investigating forces. It helps us find out more about our planet and the universe around it. Join me next time when we find out what forces make things turn around. Yeah.